I'm going to start the webinar. There we go. Hello everybody, welcome. We're just waiting for the numbers to stabilize. Just bear with us. Hello to those of you still arriving. We're just waiting for the numbers to stabilise and then we'll make a start. Hello to those of you still arriving. We'll make a start very shortly. Welcome to everybody still logging in. It's great to see you all today. Good to see that we've got some good numbers as well. as if numbers have stabilised, so we'll make a start. Hello again from Cambridge Biomedical Campus Wellness Campaign. As some of you already know, because you've tuned in before, I'm Jill Wilson. And as we always say, wherever you are in the world today, welcome. Because the desire and the need for wellness is universal. And these webinars are not just for the 20,000 plus people who work on the Cambridge Biomedical Campus there for everyone. So as usual, please feel free to share these links far and wide. Today, I have great pleasure in introducing Sarah Logic. Now, Sarah is a PhD scientist who worked in and led academic and industry research discovery teach and the industry research discovery teams before retraining as a leadership coach. For the past 10 years, Sarah's been working with leaders in the pharmaceutical industry to give them the skills, the knowledge and the confidence they need to be impactful and inspiring leaders that create and foster inclusive environments where everyone can thrive. Now, Please, can you put any questions as you think of them in the Q&A? And Sarah will attempt to answer some of them after the presentation. So with no further ado, I will hand over to her. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Jill. And hi to everyone who's watching. Um, thank you for joining. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, Jill, to talk about a subject that's very close to my heart. Now, I hope you're here because you're interested in hearing about your scientist self-saboteur and understanding how to conquer it. You might already be very familiar with this saboteur and know what I'm referring to, or you might just have some ideas about what it is, but maybe you're not quite sure, or your knowledge level may be different from that. And all of this is absolutely fine. It doesn't matter where you're starting from because wherever you are starting from, I promise that you'll get value from this webinar. Now, even if you had heard everything that I'm going to talk about today, there's still value because repetition, as I'm sure you know, is, I was going to say important, but I'm actually Actually going to extend that to essential particularly for adults it's an essential part of learning so there's always value in hearing things again and 
If you listen with a beginner's mind, I absolutely guarantee that you'll get some new insights. I do this all the time. I read books over and over. I listen to people talking about the same topics, things that I think I know everything about, and I always get some value. So that is my goal for today for you. So your self-saboteur is basically that voice in your head that tells you, often in many different ways, that you're not good enough or that you can't or shouldn't do something or maybe that you should do something. Now, depending on your level of awareness, it might not manifest as a voice as such, or there might be a little part of you that's afraid to admit that you have a voice in your head, and that was where I was a few years ago, and and all of that's fine. But even if you don't sort of relate to hearing a voice, perhaps what you do relate to is that feeling of, I, I sometimes feel like I have a bit of an imposter syndrome. So if you're still with me at this point, um, I hope you're in the right place because what I'm going to talk to you about, what I want you to learn today, and I'm sorry, I'm just having a little bit of problem um, moving my slides forward, but we'll overcome that. My saboteur is screeching at me, but it's all going to be fine. Um, I'm going to talk to you about where this saboteur comes from. I'm going to explain why I believe that the scientist saboteur is so much more powerful than a regular saboteur and talk about the impact it has on you when you when we let it rule our lives. Now, I'm not going to jump straight into telling you how to overcome your self-saboteur because you kind of need all this knowledge and information to help you get to that point. It will all make sense as I go through the presentation. So please um stay with me as I as I explain things to you it's all helpful it's all news and information that your saboteur needs to hear um so I thought I'd give you a little bit sorry I'm really struggling with my slides I have a question that I'd like to ask first and we're not running it as a poll. So if you can just pop your answer in the chat. I'm curious to know who we have in the audience. So do you identify as a scientist? I know it's a yes or no answer, but I've given a third option. So just put in the chat, yes, no, or sometimes. And as you're thinking about that or popping your answer straight in, depending on your personality type, I'll explain to you kind of why I'm here and talking to you about this topic. So, as Jill has already said, I'm a scientist. Um, but there were times in my career when I didn't feel like a real scientist because I thought I wasn't good enough, or smart enough, or that everyone else was doing better than me. And I thought I was lucky to have got my PhD and lucky to have got my fellowships and my jobs and all luck. That was how I got to where I was. It wasn't based on talent. It wasn't based on ability, maybe a little bit, but it was all luck. Now, if those thoughts and feelings sound familiar at all to you, then first of all, know that you're not alone. I hear this a lot from my clients as well as relating to it myself. Um, but you will know that those feelings um, that belief that you have totally saps your confidence and can leave you feeling anxious and stressed as you work incredibly hard trying to be good enough. So I know from personal experience that this is an exhausting and demoralizing way to live and work. And it's also the way to squash rather than harness your talents. Because what we do when we feel like this is we often, and we're sometimes not even aware of this, we often try and be like everyone else around us who's seemingly more successful than us. And in doing that, we lose the very brilliance of being ourselves. Now, back then, I thought these thoughts and feelings were truth. I thought they were real, in fact, because I didn't really know about the mind and I didn't know about the self-sabotage 
and how all of that worked. And so the reason that I'm here today is that I've been on quite a journey to get to where I am now and help me know how to overcome those thoughts and feelings. And what I love to do now is to help other people overcome them and also to help them in working with leaders to help them create environments in their teams and organizations where it's harder for the saboteur to thrive. So you could say I love sabotaging the self-saboteur and outside of work, one of the things I do to help myself is run. I'm not very good, but I run. And this is a picture from, of me and my brother um, running on Sunday, just gone, in what felt like the blistering heat of Manchester in the Great Manchester Half Marathon. And you'll see I'm wearing a, a charity shirt for Diabetes UK, and I'll come back to that in a little while. So I'm going to see if there is anything in the chat and it does look like there's some things. So we have got, oh, brilliant, a mixture of responses. We've got lots of scientists. We've got some people who, who don't um, think of themselves as a scientist, whether you are or you aren't. An actual scientist, you will still get a lot of value from this presentation. And I saw the odd sometimes. So. I'd actually love to know more about that, but um, I'm not the only one. An elapsed scientist. You never a lapsed scientist, in my view. Um, okay, thank you very much for taking part in that chat. I, uh, I really appreciate that. So let's make a start, if I can. I don't know why I'm struggling. Very much to navigate my slides. There we go. Um, so. Let's talk about where, sorry, where the saboteur comes from. So my saboteur, well, I'll, get, I'll take a step back. Most people benefit from thinking of their self-saboteur as, as a character. Now, if this is starting to make you feel a little bit uneasy at the idea that we're now talking about sub characters within ourselves then please be reassured it is not a sign of insanity or madness it's actually perfectly normal and perhaps even more importantly it's a proven way to help overcome your self-saboteur so a book that quite literally changed my life and I highly recommend this to pretty much anyone I speak to is The Chimp Paradox by Steve Peters. And Steve talks about the chimp. So, and it's a, he's not specifically talking about the saboteur, but it's the work of his book is, is what kickstarted my whole personal development journey. And it's very much a part of what I'm talking to you about now. So in my head, my saboteur is a chimp. Um, some people find it really helpful to give their saboteur a name. I don't personally do that. Mine's just a chimp. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, so I don't need to keep saying the word saboteur, we're going to call our chimp Sally. And I hugely apologise if we have any Sallys in the audience. I don't know where that name came from. It just came into my head. So Sally is essentially that part of the brain. She, if you like, she exists in that part of the brain that evolved to keep us safe from danger. But from when we were hunter-gatherers and lived in caves and to stay alive, we needed to be part of a tribe. And we had a huge array of enemies and threats that we needed to avoid. So for Sally to do her job, she needs to be hyper vigilant, looking out for danger and threats all the time. And unfortunately, even though we don't live in caves anymore, she still does this. And when Sally sees um, a threat such as a predator, she's obviously going to kick off the stress response, the fight, flight or freeze response. And she's going to do everything she can to ensure we remember the circumstances of this threat so that we can try to avoid it in the future. And I'll come back to this theme when I talk about ladders. So. Now, a very interesting feature, and it's actually fairly recently that I thought about this and learned about it, is that if you think about 
that time we we needed to be part of a tribe right we depended on other people we depended on our tribe because if we were unable to go out and hunt ourselves we needed we needed everyone else to get us food we needed people to take care of us so sally needs to care what other people think she needs to be sure she doesn't annoy or upset anyone in her tribe particularly the leaders of her tribe especially when she is feeling weak or vulnerable so i wonder if anyone is starting to recognize um sally in themselves or possibly in in other people um i think this is very evident when you look at young people particularly adolescents in our especially in our modern world they care very much about what other people think and frustrating though we find that this is actually an inbuilt part of being human it's something that we need to learn to overcome now there's a very important um psychological principle i guess that i that i want to talk to you about because you you really need to get this and maybe you already do know it but we're going to go for it again you really need to get this in order for everything that i'm about to tell you to be able to put into action and bring about change for yourself so we tend to think that um this is the cycle so something happens we have an event it creates emotions and that drives behaviors so for example someone shouts at me I get upset, angry, afraid, and that drives me to either run away and hide, cry, or shout back, depending. Um, but actually, there are some really important and valuable missing pieces from this cycle. The first of which is thoughts. So the cycle actually goes like this. An event happens, and we create thoughts about it. And it's the thoughts that drive the emotions. Now, if, if this is the first time you're hearing this, you might be thinking, well, yeah, obviously. But for the vast majority of us, we're completely unaware of this. And even though we have these thoughts, and even though when we're told this, we go, well, yeah, of course we sort of associate the emotion with the event. So we'll say things like, you made me angry, or you made me upset, or, um, you know, the, I don't know where this is coming from, the bus was late, and that, that made me really anxious. Um, and, and that's true, but we're missing the fact that actually it's the thoughts that are driving the emotions. And the reason this is so important is that we absolutely can control our thoughts if we learn how to and work at it. Another important aspect is the physical sensations that we get when we're in this cycle. Now, some of you will be extremely aware of these and by physical sensations, I mean how your body reacts. So if you're feeling stressed or upset, you might be feeling hot or you might be feeling cold or sweaty. You might feel your pulse racing. Maybe you feel sick or maybe you have a stomach ache. Those are all the physical sensations that I'm referring to. Some of you, I pretty much guarantee, will be sitting there going, no, nope, I don't get any of those. Um, you do. You're just not aware of them. And the reason these are important is because essentially this is like our warning system. This is our alert system to remind us that we're going around in this cycle. So when we come to work on trying to conquer Sally, these are really helpful because they can serve, once we become aware of them, they serve as a reminder um, that something is going on that we might want to control. So, some of these thoughts that Sally had, let's say, in the cave are also relevant to today. Now, she may not normally need to worry about being eaten alive, or at least not literally. Though we use that phrase, right, don't we? You'll get eaten alive. Think about where that's likely to come from. Um, but these thoughts are still things that we essentially have today. So 
don't let them see you're weak or vulnerable. How many of us can honestly put our hand on the heart and say we never feel that? Um, please like me. I think most of us can relate to that, at least at some point in our life. And if we look at our work interactions very closely and carefully, and honestly, I think there's an element of that. These are all thoughts that were coming from Sally that were there to protect us in an environment that we no longer live in. Um, one of my favorites, they think that, um, I hear this so often with people that I work with, I do it myself. We, when we're in a situation where we maybe feel uncomfortable, we start speculating, considering, hypothesizing, assuming we know what other people are thinking about us. Um, and we don't. We never know. But all of these message messages are really quite negative normally. If you relate to having a self-sabotage, all these messages are really negative and making you feel not so great. And also getting in the way of you being you at work and sometimes maybe at home also. So, but how do these things maybe manifest today? What kind of things might be triggering us in the modern world? So obviously we still encounter real genuine physical threats occasionally, such as illnesses or an accident on the road. But in terms of the self-sabotage, we're really thinking about um, our, our work environment. We're thinking about what kind of what kind of things really trigger Sally into getting upset or angry or scared that actually we wish that she didn't. So if you have any thoughts yourself, um, pop them in the chat and I'll have a little look in a minute. Um, and there are no wrong answers here, right? Because it's this is all very individual. And, and it's really great to share the thoughts that are coming to your mind because actually quite often when somebody else reads that, it will really help them and they'll go, oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't think about that. Um, so I'm a coach that works with people in the business setting. Now, obviously, there are there are things at home as well as at work that that trigger Sally, that influences that where our self sabotage comes in. Um, but in the work context, you know, these are the types of things that I hear people talk about. Um, I'm giving a big presentation to the senior management or to I don't know the a big conference and I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling scared, or even, you know, I just don't feel confident speaking up in a meeting, or I hate having difficult conversations, I've got to give someone some feedback and I really don't want to have that, or I need to get some feedback and I'm not looking forward to that conversation. So these are all the things in, in our everyday work life. Um, that are, if you like, tapping into that saboteur, tapping into Sally, who's looking out for threats and things that are scary all the time. I'm just gonna see if I can see if there is anything in the chat. I'm thinking of this as perceived thoughts, appraise, emotions, response, behaviors. Yeah, thank you. Um, comparison with what others have achieved in life. Yeah, that's a huge one, isn't it? Um, how, how will it come across? Oh, brilliant. Yeah, great. So, yeah, I'm, I'm saying, that's <laughs> so funny. So that's just been going through my mind. I was just talking then and I thought, I don't think I made that super clear. So now my saboteur is telling me, oh, you need to go, you need to apologize. You need to go back and correct that. Um, it's happening all the time. Every interaction we have, most of us are having almost like these little mini messages from Sally. And what I want to get you to do is to be able to learn to recognize them and then have a dialogue. Um, so almost like a little conversation. Again, remembering that this is not a sign of madness. Um, the feeling that my boss always thinks I could work harder. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing, everyone. Um, keep popping things in, in the chat because I'm sure others will get, will get value from 
from reading the things that you're sharing because then we know we're not alone right when when someone says the thing that we're thinking and that's actually really powerful in just helping us feel a little bit less uncomfortable um okay so i i alluded to this this kind of characteristic if you like earlier on when i was talking about sally and this sort of little mini story that I'm going to tell you is is a is adapted a bit, maybe quite a lot from something in Steve Peters book that I just really I find it really powerful. So this is sort of trying to describe how Sally behaves and perceives danger. And it helps you think about the impact that it has on you um, in other settings. So this is the ladder story. Um, so let's say this isn't a great image for it, but let's say you're outside and you need to climb a ladder and it's been raining. So the ladder is slippy. You've maybe got inappropriate shoes on and they're slippy too. And you go up the ladder and you fall off. Now, you don't injure yourself dreadfully, but, you know, you have a little bit. So the human, um, Steve Peters talks about the chimp and the human and the computer in our brain the human might say something like oh you know that was stupid i shouldn't have gone up the ladder in in the wet and you know i know ladders are dangerous they so should have been more careful the chimp sally will say ladders are dangerous never go up a ladder ever again and then she will do everything possible to stop you from going up a ladder ever again, and maybe even encourage you to warn anyone that you care about not to go up a ladder ever again. I wish I could see faces at this point, because it'd be great to see if people are going, oh, yeah, I get that. Um, so the next time Sally sees a ladder, or God forbid, thinks that you're going to go try and climb a ladder, she's going to do everything she can to stop you. And that might be, you know, saying things like, well, no, no, come on. Remember the last time you fell and you really hurt yourself. You might have broken your neck. You, you get the idea. So hopefully now you're getting an idea of, of where the self-saboteur comes from. It's that primitive part of our brain that evolved to keep us safe from danger. But in the modern world, it finds danger in things that we have to encounter on a regular basis. On top of that, Sally is pretty, um, let's be kind and call her extreme and dramatic in her thinking. So she can turn relatively minor incidents into a massive deal and make us absolutely terrified of people or settings, um, even environments that we need to encounter on a daily basis. So imagine, imagine if you could get control of that. And that's where I want us to get to. So I'm just going to pop this up again um, as I summarize, because it comes back to these thoughts, right? So this is what Sally is. Sally, are those, it, Sally is, the, is those thoughts that come after an event that drives the emotions that dictates the behaviors. So that's why we need to interfere, to notice those thoughts and intervene and create new thoughts. Now, one of the reasons I really love to work with scientists is because I used to be a scientist and, and I relate to the work that you do. And it's very important to me personally because I've had type one diabetes since the age of 12. So medical research, technical innovation, anything to do with that. I really genuinely feel personally the value and I know the value and importance. And I also know how hard it is. But another reason that I'm really passionate about the work that I do is because I genuinely believe that the very training that has made us great scientists, and yes, you are a great scientist, um, has essentially turned the self-saboteur into a super beast. So just think for a moment about the type of training that you get as a scientist, what you're taught how to do, the messaging that you receive. And remember that Sally got all that too. 
So she got exposed to exactly the same messaging, but she took it all very, very literally and made it into a much bigger thing. So I put some of the things that I think about and I guess hear about from, from my clients. Um, there may be others. There may be some that are others that you think of that are very general. There may be some that are very specific to you. Um, but think about how Sally might have interpreted something like, um, you need to be the expert. You need to know everything there is to know about this topic. You need to know more than anyone else. Um, how might Sally have reacted to that feeling of com competition if you're, you know, if you're working in cutting edge science and you're trying to get your paper out first, you've got to be first, you've got to be the best, there've got to be no holes in the data, um, which brings me to analysis. How good are we at looking at the detail and looking for mistakes and problems and errors? How much are we taught to um, respect the expert to get to know the right people. And yes, even that annoying professor who often seems to be talking a load of rubbish, we can't be rude to them. We can't challenge or question them because they sit on the board that's going to decide if we get our next round of funding or not. I'm guessing that you're now starting to form some ideas in your own mind, your logical brain, about how some of your personal characteristics might be coming from this. And, and hopefully you're with me in the fact that this science chain that we have, brilliant though it is, has only, only served, sorry, has also served to supercharge Sally or self Sabotar. So that's why I want to help people like people like scientists, scientists so much because um, it's so important for us to get over. Um, all of these things, and yet it's so hard because everything we've been taught has told us how important it is. Um, I think you can probably gather that I'm quite passionate about this subject and I could quite easily drone on and on, so I'm very much trying to uh, keep track of where I need to be in my presentation. So you probably already thinking about some of this if not all of this and additional things yourself now but why do we care <laughs> about all this why are you still sitting here hopefully why am I here talking about this why have I read I don't know how many books and articles about this well because the impact of the self-saboteur on our lives if they're ruling is huge so as a scientist these are these are the things that I know are connected to your self-saboteur and specifically that scientific training but not not uniquely we all have these to some extent so second guessing yourself analysis paralysis perfectionism if I had a pound for every time I hear someone tell me they're a little bit of a perfectionist um yeah I'd be I'd be pretty well off Micromanagement is an interesting one, but this is also, believe it or not, connected to self-saboteur. Micromanagement is not because your team are not capable and you need to be on top of what they're doing. It's much more about what you are thinking about the need to be in control of everything um, than anything else and not wanting to be a failure. A reluctance to speak up. Wow, this is this is like my big passion, if I'm honest. Um, it frustrates me so much that so much brilliant science gets missed and lost um, because the quieter people who have the brilliant ideas are in an environment where it feels so difficult to express them, to speak up, because you're afraid. You're afraid of hurting someone, upsetting someone, angering someone. All that is Sally. Hopefully you can see that now. Um, very similar to this. Um, you've probably heard of the concept of groupthink. It's a psychological phenomena 
where we will go with what everyone else is saying. So there are some fascinating studies done along this line where they set people up and will show them, very simple, show them two lines. One is longer than the other. And there'll be one person in the room that is that is the, um, I've forgotten the word, being, being analysed. And then everyone else in the room is, is part of the experiment, if you like. So they all know what's about to happen. And they'll be asked to select the longest line. And all the people who are in the know will select the shortest one and say that's the longest one. The vast majority of people in that setting will agree with them, even though they know it's wrong. That's groupthink. Now imagine that in, in an arena where innovation and novel thinking is absolutely critical. And even if that doesn't convince you, because I'm sure you can see the impact of all this on your ability to do your job well, um, but also maybe more importantly, all of this leads to so much stress and unhappiness, not just at work and at home. And this is why it's really important. This is why I really hope you get something from this presentation that will help you get more control of your self-saboteur. So on to the juicy bit. How do we do it? How do we tame and conquer our self-saboteur? Now, um confession time. I had planned to generate a little PDF file that would help sort of walk you through this process because it's kind of a process that I want you to be able to go through. I haven't done it yet, but at the end of the presentation, I'll um, share a barcode, which essentially you can scan and that will connect us or send you to my LinkedIn profile. If you connect with me on LinkedIn and send me a message, I will generate this PDF and I will get one to you because it is actually about doing some thinking, um, being structured in your thinking and taking some notes, writing some things down. And please don't switch off at this point and think, well, that sounds like a lot of work because just think about the impact that this is going to have. Think about how life would be if you didn't have that feeling, that voice in your head telling you all the negative stuff that it's telling you. And it's not a lot of work. It just requires a little bit of effort. But I would love to remove part of it by giving you this PDF. So you've probably already read what's on the slide. So essentially, the secret to conquering your self-saboteur is to get to know your self-saboteur. And that's why it requires you to do some thinking, because I can't tell you what your self-saboteur gets upset about. So that's the first question. You know, what is it that upsets your self-saboteur? What are those um, situations, those things? Who are those people that trigger you, that make you feel whatever it is, angry, scared, upset, worried, nervous, anxious? We've heard about our boss. Um, we've heard about other people being better than us. So notice those situations where you feel that trigger and write them down. Create yourself a little list. Feels negative at the start, but it's going to get positive. This is, this is like the platform you need to help you move forward. Try and notice the physical symptoms that you get in these situations. Um, as I said before, some of you will find this really easy. You may even know them now, but for others, others it will be harder. And you will have to, when you notice yourself in, or when you go into a situation that you know is likely to be stressful, just try and take a little note of what's going on in your body. Is your heart beating faster? There'll be just things that happen so often you don't take notice of them. And again, write those down because those are like your early warning signal. Those are telling you, right, it's like a prompt in your brain, like the Pavlov um, experiment, prompting you to remember to take notice of what's going on and change your thoughts. Now, if you can connect to that, um, yes, there's a thought in my head, there's a voice in my head, what do they say? 
What words, literally, what words, what phrases do they say? I appreciate you're not going to want to write these down in the moment, but try and keep track, try and make um, a little collection of all those phrases. Some of them you may know now already. Write them down because what you're going to do next is take those phrases and work out what will calm Sally down. So what's like the opposite? So if we go back to our ladder, um, in that setting, so we've fallen off the ladder, we've had that incident and we need to go up the ladder again. So most people will be feeling a little bit anxious at this point. Um, we'd say something like, oh, in, in our head, you don't have to say it out loud. Um, it is more powerful if you can say it out loud, but you can say it in your head and it will work. We would say something like, oh, it's OK. You know, yes, I know I fell off last time, but it was slippy. It was wet. It's dry today. I'm going to be really careful. And I know to some of you that will sound so stupid and so lame. So you're going to have to trust me that this is the way to do it. It actually really does work. So you're looking to create a phrase to counter the saboteur phrase. Something to reassure it. This is why having it in your head as a character helps. What will make it feel calm and what will reassure it? Think of it as a toddler. How do I reassure that it's okay? Another very powerful way to do this is to create new positive experiences connected to the negative. So that phrase, um, they need to get back on the saddle. If you've fallen off a horse or a bike and had an accident, then the next time you want to get back on, it's scary. There's some anxiety, um, some nerves, some physical symptoms. You may even think, I don't think I ever want to get back on the bike again. Right? That's that's Sally, because Sally's your sabotage has taken that memory of that incident and turned it into, and we're always going to fall off. So the way to overcome that is to get back in the saddle and have an experience where you don't fall off and do that over and over again. And then in time, it becomes easier. And some of you may have done something like this and go, yeah, I can relate to that, actually. And um, that's because what you're doing is creating lots of positive experiences. So when Sally sees a horse or a cycle, Okay, she still remembers that bad accident, but she also has lots of positive experiences that reinforce your message. That would be something like, it's okay, that was an accident. Um, I fell off because, or chances of that happening again are really slim. This is okay, it's going to be fine. And that's what that reinforce those positive experiences refers to. So it's almost not enough. It is helpful to have a new positive experience, but to make sure they get, if you like, lodged in the brain, to make sure they don't just get lost in the noise of the millions of incidents that our brain encounters every single day, you need to reinforce them by saying something about it. Again, I know this feels very strange. Um, I used to resist all this stuff. By the way, uh, I never used to do any of this until I realized the power. But by saying to yourself um, something like, wow, that was that was a great bike ride. That was a great horse ride. You know, I felt really safe. And um, you're you're sort of making those experiences more important to your brain. You're elevating them so the brain will retain them and then use them in the future when you want them to be used um yeah I've got this image now of lots of people sitting there going oh no this feels so awkward and I know it does um but give it a try it's actually really powerful you don't have to do it that many times before you'll start to start to see the power and you know it becomes harder when it's something that maybe you don't naturally um, acknowledge yourself so if you give a good presentation for example or if you give a presentation where you didn't die and nobody threw fruit at you and you know nobody told you how terrible it was that's good okay so you need to come away from that and actually say something to yourself to remind yourself that it was a good experience just give it a try now 
The secret, or maybe not so secret these days, tip from top performers um, that essentially taps into one of the most bizarre things I find about the, the brain or the mind, which is that it's actually pretty useless at telling the difference between reality and made up. So this is what a lot of sort of um, affirmations are based on. This fact that if you say I am brilliant, the brain doesn't know that that may or may not be true. It takes it as true. So if you do that over and over and over again, it starts to believe it. Now, you might not be interested in, in affirmations, um, but be interested in the fact that your brain cannot tell the difference between made up and reality. So make up a good experience. So think about top athletes will, um, will do this all the time. So they will, in preparation for a big race, they will visualize themselves running the race, often like minute by minute, um, and winning or getting the time that they want. And they'll do this over and over because it works. The reason it works is because the brain doesn't know that it's not really happened. It almost like files it away as a real experience. So when you get to the start line, your brain is less scared than it might be because it thinks it's already done it. Sounds really weird, but that was part of the reason for putting up that um, running picture and saying, I'm not a great runner. So for me to run a half marathon is actually quite a big thing. Um, and so I do, I visualize myself crossing the finish line. I haven't got the patience to do the whole run because it takes too long, but, but it works, it really works. So you can give that a try. Um, I'm trying to think if I've missed anything off. Uh, I don't think that I have. So I think what I may do is, uh, yes, I was going to summarize using this. And I'm hoping that at this point, you're almost like going, oh, not again, because you really get it. <laughs> so our self-saboteur is those thoughts. And it's so powerful because of the power of our thoughts. It's the thoughts, not the event, that drives the emotions, that makes us feel the way we feel. So we can't necessarily control the event all the time, but we can control our thoughts. It just takes practice. So don't give up the first attempt. Keep, keep practicing it. Use the kind of formula that I talked through send me a message on LinkedIn if you want some more information. But I promise you, if this is the only thing you take away and you just try it a little bit, it will, it, it will change your life. A bit overdramatic, it probably is time to finish now. Um, thank you very much for listening. Those of you who are, are still here, um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, so just, I just want to say, please do connect with me on LinkedIn if you'd like to know any more or you'd like that, that PDF and that will force me to make it. And the QR code um, should take you directly to my LinkedIn profile. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. Absolutely fascinating. And I can see some comments coming in there as well thanking you so yeah really really thought provoking which i think is probably what you were aiming for yeah wrong yeah uh yeah we've got one food for thought now has anybody got any questions if you've got questions please pop them in the q a um and sarah will see if she can answer them yeah, it might be that she's covered an awful lot of ground, which she has, mm -hmm. and you haven't got an awful lot of questions. Um, so somebody said um, they're not on LinkedIn, so could I share the barcode via another means? So that barcode just takes you to my LinkedIn profile. If you're not on LinkedIn, you can drop me 
an email at sarah at leadersinflow.com. And I believe that this, this slide and therefore this information will be on the YouTube um, video. So you can, you can come back to that. And if Sarah lets me have the PDF, I can send that out to everybody who's registered for the event today. Uh, I did see something come in on the chat. Any tips for deciphering those physical symptoms? Any tips for deciphering? Hmm. Um, not entirely sure I understand what that question is, deciphering. Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm going to start by answering... Uh, I'll just start talking and then if you, if I'm not giving you the right information, just pop, pop so another I mean, question I find, in. I find it difficult to notice them. Right. Yes. OK. So so that is is practice um, and being very intentional about wanting to notice them. And unfortunately, what it probably means is that you need to put yourself in a situation where you know your saboteur is going to be active or you get those feelings that you don't want to get and and sort of try and find a way of sitting quietly for a few minutes and just literally so in therapy speak scan your body so I they normally say start at your feet but I'm going to suggest for this start in your head so you literally just draw your attention to your head and think you know is anything feeling tense can I feel anything in my eyes also that would be the point at which you might capture your um your thoughts you know what what, what am I hearing um, and then kind of literally go go down your body and the reason I'm saying start here is because we're normally feeling it in our torso mm -hmm. so my shoulders how are my shoulders feeling um is there any tension there? Am I going like this? Or am I shrinking in my seat? All those kind of things. But it, it, it is, it does have to be intentional at the start. But once you start noticing things, then it will become easier. Um, yeah. It's about also asking yourself, um, suddenly <clears throat> being aware of what you're feeling and then asking yourself why you might be feeling that mm. going inside looking inside because often our presenting feeling is not necessarily what is triggering it so if we can recognize and accept that presenting feeling and mm. then look and see what's really going on if as you say Sarah we can sit quiet and we've got the time and the space and the confidence to do that yeah you often find the root cause of it yeah no it, and it's good that you said that confidence word there Jill because I think it's not always it's not always easy easy to do that and and actually that's just reminding me of a point I did forget to make when we think about that cycle of event thought um, emotion behavior another important point is that that cycle can start anywhere so actually when our self-sabotage is really really ruling the roost we don't even need an event it's just the thought so that's the 3 a.m thing right when you're in the middle of the night you wake up it's just your thoughts that are causing the chaos isn't it nothing's actually happening um so that's important to remember and the physical symptoms too they might be the first thing that you notice um yeah i, could, I, I know, keep stopping something. Those physical symptoms are a manifestation of what's going on inside us, aren't they? So when we get yeah. a physical symptom, let's ask, why am I getting this? Because you're not yeah. getting it for no reason. That's we've, so true, yeah. We've, we've got a comment here. If you've been listening to the chimp thoughts for years, does it mean that it will take an equal amount of time ah. to get on top of them? Really good question there. Yeah, very good question. Um, no, not necessarily. I can't quote any um, any actual data on this, but but I can tell you from personal experience um, that sometimes it can be like that. Once you know, there'll be some sort of moment where you go, oh, and, and it, it can be instant. You will have to work at the dialogue bit, the sort of constant chit chat. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes, so what I find is when I've got a lot of stuff going on in my life, when things are quite stressful, then the chimp becomes a little bit more active because I'm not, I'm not noticing it as much because I'm noticing all this other stuff. So um, 
it's a constant thing. It's not a, oh, I'll learn how to do this tomorrow and then I'm good. It it's it's literally is a journey. But no, just because you've had it running riot, let's say, for, for 10 years does not mean it's going to take you that much longer to get over it. And I would argue it's probably less time than someone that says, I don't have a chimp. Yes. Because everyone has a chimp. <laughs> so you've noticed yours. That's the first step. So it's the self-awareness, isn't it? Mm. And once we are aware we've got a chimp and once we are generally very self-aware of what we are, what we're thinking, why we're thinking it, what's going on in our body, what our body is reflecting, then that is more than the first step to do yeah. without it, isn't it? Yeah. Gosh, there's lots of questions. Um, we've got one here. Are there any practices that you find helpful? Yeah, so that's perhaps similar to, there's another question right at the end, could you recommend a morning routine to start a day stronger in anti-chimp mode? Love I love like that, anti-chimp. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Jill, you you may have some great morning routines. Um, I mean, for me, I think, oh, I'm not a morning person, so I'm I'm not going to lie, I really struggle. But but it is about that don't don't sort of get up and check your phone first thing. Don't go straight into reactive mode. Don't expose yourself to the kind of things that are going to trigger trigger you. Um, if you're into meditation, that really helps just sort of calming the brain down. Anything to calm the brain down helps calm the chimp. So for me, running is a great outlet. Um, I do other techniques. Um, affirmations just writing some positive things a gratitude journal starting the day by thinking of the positive things that happened the day before um, if gratitude doesn't rock your boat something that I relate to better is like an achievement thing so literally writing down um, three things that you achieved the previous day um, and you know I've been in a in in bad places sometimes where getting out of bed was an achievement you still write that down um so what you're doing there is just you're sending all these positive messages to your chimp and yourself that that you're capable you're able you're able to do things before i go to sleep at night i have a mantra that i will wake up and when i wake up i will be relaxed but i will mm. feel motivated i will feel refreshed and mm. generally it works because you're programming your brain for the next morning. And I think if you can wake up with at least a positive attitude or as positive as you can be, it can be very, very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, I think that's a that's a good one because you're setting that as you fall asleep, which then helps have a, have a restful mm. um, night's sleep. So someone's asked, is this the same as mindfulness? Um uh, similar I'm not I'm not a mindfulness expert um, mindfulness tends to be focusing on the breath so we have meditation which is more general and then mindfulness is literally focusing on the breath breathing in concentrating on the breath and as your thoughts come in which your thoughts will come in they mm. do unless you're some Tibetan monk of 50 years experience you will get thoughts coming in and you just watch the thought come in and then you watch it go out and you bring your thought back to the breath. And in a way, it pushes or tries to push everything else out. So mindfulness can be very, very helpful. And you can do it at any time of the day. You can do it at the bus stop. You don't have to close your eyes. You can just focus on the breath and it can be very, very calming, as mm. can breathing in. I'm very conscious of breathing in and then breathing out slowly for longer than you breathed in. And that can actually regulate your mm. system as well. That's so powerful, the breathing thing, isn't it? Um, yeah, very much. I use that with, yeah, my daughter and it's, inc it's incredible to see it happen. She doesn't like that, but I just, I'll just slow my breathing and then naturally she'll slow her so it's it's not it's not really the same as as mindfulness it in when listening to Jill it's almost like the opposite isn't it because I'm asking you to pay attention to those thoughts um but I guess if you're working on um, managing your chimp or your self-saboteur then doing that alongside sort of mindfulness to, to help balance I think would be would be really great 
I think it all works. It's all got a place. It's about everybody trying it themselves yeah. and seeing what works for them because what works for me doesn't necessarily work for anybody else. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I've got we've got a comment coming here to um help me be stronger in anti-chimp mode. I find it helpful to spend 10 minutes every day doing one thing that makes me happy. Oh, nice. Lovely. Yeah. That's I like that. really lovely. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking about, isn't it? And it's whatever makes you happy. What makes me happy might not be what makes you happy. Yeah. So it's whatever makes you happy personally. Oh, I've just seen one that I really want to share. I know we've got like 30 seconds left. Um, someone's just said, well, they said it's helpful to hear from a scientist. Fellow scientists, as I tend not to believe positive messages that I tell myself because I feel like it's encouraging an unscientific positive bias. But this has been a helpful reminder that my chimp has a negative bias. So I'm just balancing it out. Yeah. I love that. I oh, love that. Yeah. Because so often we we hold ourselves back because we don't want to be arrogant. We don't want to be. Yeah, we don't we don't want to be overconfident. Right. We're worried about that. So that's a brilliant message to to end on if we're ending that yeah just think of it as balancing the scales and And the unconscious mind the unconscious mind believes whatever we tell it yeah we're going to give it negative messages the unconscious mind will say yep that's it because that's what you say so if you plant positive messages even if you're not feeling positive it can have a great effect on your mood. It's the same as smiling. If you make yourself Mm. smile when you're not happy, it actually tells those parts of your brain that need to know that you actually feel different. Yeah, yeah. So I would like to say a huge thanks to Sarah because this has been really, really interesting. And for the interaction that everybody yeah. has given online, it's been great. Uh, there's been an awful lot of interaction. I think that's very satisfying because it, it means that you're involved. It means that you're listening and it means you have questions. If you have further questions, do send them in to me via Eventbrite and I can send mm. them on to Sarah. Or well, you've also got Sarah's contact details as well. You can send them to her directly. Uh, clearly this chimp has been messing with a lot of us including me love that as well busy busy chimp very much so so I want to thank Sarah again I want to thank everybody for turning up today and participating so brilliantly